So welcome everyone. We are Pioneer Valley Writers Workshop. I'm Joy Balio. I'm the founder of Pioneer Valley Writers Workshop. And here with us moderating the event too is Kate Senecal, who is our assistant director. And this event, The Art and Challenges of Writing Memoir, featuring Julie Skolnick and Sarah Rausch, we'll be talking about the process of writing memoir. We'll be talking about the craft of memoir. We'll also be beginning with short readings from Sarah and Julie, focusing on their recent, their recent memoirs. So before we start and before we introduce you to them, the clock and, and, and the chiming clock in my background here, um, before we, we introduce you to the authors, I'll tell you just very quickly about who we are, what Pioneer Valley Writers Workshop is. Essentially, we offer writing workshops. We have an array of one-day classes. We have multi-week workshops. We also offer a lot of author events and panels, different community events, Mostly, pretty much everything we do right now is virtual, though we did just recently have an in-person orchard author reading, but we're mostly virtual right now and will be for the foreseeable future. If you're interested in what we do, you can sign up on our to, for our newsletter at pioneervalleywriters.com or .org, and that's where we send out all updates about classes, about events, about our monthly community writing which is free and open to everyone to attend on the first Friday of the month. I lead that, I do a series of prompts. It's free and open to everyone. So check that out all on our website. And also just opening, happening this fall is our year, oh, it's now changed to 10 month, but our 10 month manuscript program is opening for applications this fall. So you can check that out also if you're interested in a supportive longer term program for, for book length work. So tonight, what we're going to be doing, we'll listening to readings from Sarah and Julie, and then we'll be opening up to discussion about their books, about the art and challenge of writing memoir, and also taking questions from the audience and talking with them more about memoir writing. So um, let before we, just some, so a couple quick basics about Zoom. If everyone can just make sure that you are muted throughout that would that just helps everything. Um, also, if you have questions that arise during the reading, feel free to drop those in the chat. You can also feel free to show love and show uh, parts you love, parts you like from the readings, or question or any any thoughts you have about the readings. Feel free to put that in the chat. It's always lively and nice to see people responding and reacting in real time. And of course, and Kate and I will scan through the chat and pull questions from that as we um, when, when we get to the question Q and A section. So, without further ado, let us uh, introduce our readers, and they both have just really page turning, incredible stories that that I personally could not put down when I was reading their books. So I'm so happy they're here. Kate, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce our first reader, Sarah. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Rausch. Uh, Sarah Rausch is the author of the short story collection, What Shines From It, which won the Electric Book Award and is wonderful. Um, her prose has also appeared widely in literary magazines and journals, including Paper Darts, Hobart, Split Lip, So to Speak, and elsewhere. She holds an MFA from Pacific University and lives with her family in Hoyoke, Massachusetts. In XO, her recent memoir and second book, Sarah Rausch is in a long-term committed relationship with another woman when she begins a low residency MFA in fiction. Though it goes against the promises she's made, she finds herself pulled into an intense affair with a married man, a well-known writer in the program. More than an essay about bisexual, bisexual infidelity and the resulting heartbreaks, EXO unfolds Rausch's story like a map of psychic terrain, allowing the author to explore her long-standing obsessions with romantic love, personal faith and belief systems, and the stories we tell ourselves to get through our ever-changing lives. EXO was published in spring 2022 by Autofocus, and you can find her online at www.sarahrausch.com. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> thank you, Kate, for that introduction. Um, I'm going to read a short segment from the middle of EXO. It's fairly standalone, but for context, I will say that Piper is was my um, female partner at the time, and Liam was the married man that I was having, to this point, an emotional affair with, and I'm about to see him for the first time in about a year. Um, 
Due to an unprecedented ice storm and days of flight cancellations, I touched down in the Northwest shortly after midnight on the first day of the residency. When I used the bathroom outside baggage claim, I discovered my period had come on, and in that weary moment, I was grateful for its arrival. My periods are robust and distracting. Even if I were tempted by Liam, I reasoned, I wouldn't be so vulnerable as, allow, as to allow him access to something that messy. A friend picked me up at the airport, and we drove the two-hour trip to the coast in the wee hours so that I could be there for the opening remarks later that morning. We talked about failed relationships, romantic expectations, how people change, and how hard it can be to change with them. We did not talk about whether the universe was responsive or predetermined, though the thought weighed heavy on my mind. While navigating the clogged customer service hotlines and three layovers of my 24-hour travel day, I bargained with the universe as if it were listening. I would be good, I vowed. I loved Piper, and I would behave accordingly, if only it would get me across the country on time, which it had. But by the end of that long first day, being once again in Liam's presence, he'd pressed very lightly, very casually, against my back with his own. We had exchanged our pleasant greetings, and now we were each in conversation with someone else. No one in the room was aware of the galvanizing seam our bodies created in that moment. It was up to me, move or stay. In classic story structure, Freight Tag's Pyramid, there is an inciting incident that kicks off the narrative. We see this also in the hero's journey, the call to adventure. When we tell a story, we choose this inciting incident. In life, the beginning is often obscured. Was hello our inciting incident, the kiss, the chaste reconnection in an unexpected city, the eye contact across the crowded room that morning? Or was it now, when I plugged into what this electrifying force could do and lingered, giving the current a conduit? When I was making my exit that night, Liam pantomimed a question at me across the bar, and I rested my head on my hands as if asleep and left before any more could be gestured. I was exhausted, and without his body electric against mine, I'd swung back to my determination to be good and I walked home with my friends and took a sleeping pill. The next morning, up way too early, groggy from doxylamine and jet lag, I found an email from him, time stamped 12.02 a.m. It was a dark and stormy night. Alone in my room, I laughed out loud. A winter gale had ripped through while I floated in and out of restless slumber, high winds and epic waves, driving rain. Later, I'd find the beach littered with enormous blackened tree stumps still attached to their root walls, barnacled planks, an entire field of displaced sand dollars. Now, in the pale dawn light, the buildings outside my window appeared cleansed. I made myself a cup of coffee before replying, blind to his metaphor and the opening it presented, wondering if perhaps we could go for a walk on the beach. I wanted to take photos. I wanted to gain some kind of foothold on our situation. It took him the length of the day to respond, and it wasn't until that night when he bought me a bourbon and everyone around the bar was distracted, that he leaned in with a time and a place. The next afternoon, he met me inside the dunes, concealed from the hotels and promenades view, the heavy gray sky draped around us. We walked north, away from the lives we'd flown in from, and it was so easy, supercharged by dopamine and enabled by solitude, to the edge of the world. This day, the edge of the world was an estuary, where the river that flowed through the town ran headlong into the sea. Here, where gulls feed and ghost shrimp burrow, where the water is neither fresh nor salt, we stopped and stood, bodies pressed ankle to thigh, to hip, to hand, to shoulder. Beneath layers of jean and cotton and fleece and omnitech nylon, my skin ached for his. All around us, life adapted and thrived. I could not tell if the tide was in or out. Our hands entangled, I told him what I'd told myself. I promised I'd be good. He closed his eyes against the mist and said, I promised that too. We didn't kiss then. We were once again, by common moral definition, good. No lines were crossed, no boundaries breached. And yet what runner wouldn't understand this as a warm up? What sinner wouldn't recognize the deal struck? Our longing thickened and sparkled as we walked back. And though I left him at a cross street, a block before the hotel so no one might spy us together. And though I walked with a straight spine, the feral part of me was taking a long, deep breath, poised to spring. There is a poignant intimacy that occurs during an affair. Almost anyone can recognize the seduction of forbidden love, pinked skin and rippled goose flesh, shared secrets and whispers, that slight hitch each time the other enters the room. 
There is the adrenaline of the secret, the heart hammering and the hope, the just this once, me again. How much is too much, you might ask, and when do we stop? There is no answer. The night he touched my distended belly after I jokingly confessed to eating the world's biggest Reuben for dinner, I went back to my hotel room feeling full and perhaps a bit self-satisfied. I would live up to my vow, I would. We'd crossed the halfway point. I was here upholding my promise. I changed into my pajamas and washed my face and it was close to midnight when I checked my email. There was one from him. I can't help but think, what if we just had one night together? I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Wow, it, such a such a moment to leave us on, <laughs> to leave us hanging. I I remember being in reading that and just not being able to put down the book at that point. All right, so I will be introducing the next our next featured author, Julie Skolnick. Julie is a concert flutist and the founding artistic director of Mistral Music, a chamber music series which since 1997 has been known for its virtuosic artists, imaginative programming, and the personal rapport she establishes with her audiences. Paris Blue from Kohler Books is her debut memoir, a story that has lingered in the corridors of her psyche for over 40 years about young love, heartache, and the role of memory in our lives set against a backdrop of classical music and Paris. Since Julie's treatment and recovery from breast cancer in 2005, she has found ways to play and curate benefit concerts, which raise funds for support for underserved women with the disease. She lives in Boston with her husband, physicist Michael Brower. They have two adult children, also musicians whom she frequently performs with. You can find her online at www.julieskolnick.com. Dot com. Welcome, Julie. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be here. <clears throat> Thank you, Sarah, for letting me share the screen with you. I'm afraid I have a little bit more than Sarah has to read because I had a hard time deciding which sections and I put it on paper so I could go a little faster. Um, just to set you up, my book begins when I am 20 years old and have just arrived in Paris on a school year abroad program junior year abroad. And as much as I was thrilled to be there in September and October, by November, the sun disappeared behind thick clouds. There was no internet, there was no cell phone, and we were all very, very isolated and alone. So I searched for a chorus. I found one, a really good one. These two examples are uh, a way for me to explain my firm belief in love at first sight. On Thursday night, I returned to the chorus. I was enjoying the music when I was startled by a face on the other side of the semicircle. It was as if a movie camera panning casually across a sea of faces stopped and focused on just one. A young striking man, around 30 years old, sitting at the end of the second row of faces and the camera wouldn't move. It was a sensitive face radiating quiet intelligence my fascination was less about his looks, however, than about his solemn demeanor, which stood out radically from the bellowing men surrounding him. I couldn't look away. At the end of the rehearsal, he disengaged himself quickly and was out the door before most people had put on their coats. Now, this next thing is just three weeks later at, after the very first concert. When the concert was over, tremendous applause brought the soloist and conductor back on the stage for curtain calls. It surprised me that the chorus left the stage just as chaotically as members of the orchestra. Everyone was squeezing through the crowded hallways. Suddenly, my handsome bass was brushing right past me. His face was just inches from mine, but he didn't see me, intent as he was on making his way through the crowd. It was the first time I had ever seen him up close, and the effect was no less potent than if I had just imbibed a mythical love potion. I followed the stranger with my eyes through the crowds and watched his tall figure head for the stairs. So I hurried to the exit too. By the time I started climbing the stairs, he had just made the turn at the landing in the opposite direction. As I looked up, he looked down and our eyes met. He sighed as if to complain about the many stairs and I smiled. 
I was hoping that he too would exit at level minus one to take the Metro home. But when I opened the stage door to the concourse, he was gone. After the 20 minute Metro ride, I sauntered home more slowly. I let myself into the apartment with my unwieldy iron key, walked silently down to the hallway to my room and stood in front of the antique spotted mirror over the mantel without removing my coat. What did I look like to that stranger on the stairs? My cheeks were rosy and my eyes glassy from the cold walk home. For once, I didn't turn on the radio. Instead, I washed up and undressed slowly, crawled in between the sheets of my low, narrow bed, and went to sleep with the image of his face in my dreams. It was inside me somehow, like a phrase of music so beautiful, I knew I would need to hear again, or a painting that stayed with me without my knowing why. Now, this is a month later. He had already begun to drive me home from rehearsals, but nothing more had transpired. The conductor quick places with the tenors, and it was a detail that was a bit life-changing. When I walked on stage for the concert, Luke was already seated at the edge of the basses with an empty chair next to him in the soprano section. He invited me with his eyes to take that seat so we could sing the concert side by side. Although we could have done this any time during rehearsals, neither one had dared to suggest it. I sat down beside him under the bright stage lights and could feel his right shoulder and thigh pressing against my left side. It was shockingly intimate. It wasn't long before the hall grew quiet in the expected moment before the orchestra tuned and Barenboim entered to great applause. There was no way to measure my the magnitude of my happiness at that moment. Try to imagine something that might make me feel this rapturous, but nothing came close. The proximity of Luke's body, body breathing next to mine, our bodies touching in the stillness of the concert hall with neither the need nor the possibility to speak. The excruciating pleasure of knowing that we were feeling the same thing for the next two hours as we listened to music that we loved. My sensibilities were set free. He, um, I found a note wedged into my shutters. It was a short little note how he'd been sitting in his car for over an hour waiting to see if I came home. Now that he had come to my window once unexpectedly, he took another chance later that week. Early Thursday morning, I returned home to find a note scribbled with a dull blue pencil on a piece of paper wedged into the shutters. Where was I? Wandering around Paris somewhere, not knowing that anyone was looking for me. Nobody had ever looked for me or waited for me before in Paris. No one had ever noticed if I didn't return home before dark or if I were wandering the other side of the Seine, lost for hours at a time. I held the note in my hands and I cried. Eventually, I started teaching them English lessons. They started in parks and cafes, and ultimately they did migrate to my little maid's room up on the sixth floor. And this time it was always text as pretext. And this time it was Wordsworth poem, Tinter and Abbey. I've always loved that poem because it's all about memory, a lyrical meditation on memory. So I corrected him a lot and I've had to cut out a big chunk. But the more I felt his warm breath in my ear as he leaned over my shoulder to read, the more I let him get by with not just words, but entire phrases that were completely unintelligible. After a few more lines, I no longer heard a thing as I nodded yes with, a my, with my eyes closed. Mademoiselle Skolnik, he said as he kissed the back of my earlobe, you're not finding any more words to correct? He asked. And then he rolled me onto my back and kissed me slowly. This is, of course, all in the name of learning, all part of the lesson plan, I'd say in bits and pieces, when I could get enough air in between kisses. The lips must be retrained. In a lazy, lust-filled stupor, burying his face in my neck and hair, he said, I find that your pedagogical skills are much improved, Madame, Mademoiselle Skolnik, and very effective. These must be the nouvelle méthode d'anglais, the new English lessons. An hour later, I walked Luke to the bus stop, English lesson tomorrow, Julie, he asked as his bus drew near. New methods are old, I asked. He smiled and hopped onto the bus, stood in the doorway and waved goodbye. I walked around Saint-Germain as daylight faded and streets became animated with people heading home to their families under their arms. I picked up something for dinner from a small market and wandered home. 
I didn't mind that Luke left me alone. I felt flush with love as I climbed the five curving flights of stairs and one steep narrow one to my little maid's room at the top. Collapsing on my low bed to read Madame Bovary and listen to my radio, I felt safe and happy. I didn't care about Hemingway, Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, or any of the dozens of writers who would describe the magic of the city. This was my Paris now. Then, fast forward two years after we broke up to demonstrate the heartache. I couldn't get over how the world around me looked the same when everything inside me had changed. Was nothing that he wrote to me true? Or was love something so fragile that it could turn to dust just like that in the course of a few days? Phrases from all his letters I knew by heart played incessantly in my ears, like a when I took the red line from Charles Street Station to Harvard Square and the subway rose up above ground as it crossed the Charles River, my body ached for the vastly more beautiful old bridges of the Seine and for the life that I had imagined there. I'm never going back, I heard myself say. A door had shut. Open it now and I would find no enchanted garden. Now we're going to fast forward 25 years. I'm happily married with a man that I met at a newsstand, I have two kids, 10 and six. I think that's what their ages. I can't do the math now anyway, but, um, and Luke contacted me when he was in Boston on business and asked me. When I hung up, I retrieved his box of old letters from the top shelf of my closet. That box had migrated from closet to closet in five different homes since 1978. And yet there they remained eerily untouched. I reread some of them for the first time in nearly 25 years. The memories of both love and anguish were as real as if our story had happened yesterday, as if I had compartmentalized the pain and preserved it in a deep alcove of my being. I sat on the floor pouring over them one at a time, surprised that I still remembered the musical flow of each one so well. There were tears, but I didn't miss Luke. I missed myself at 20 when there was nothing in the world I was more certain that I wanted. When my concert was over, I got in my car and headed toward the Boston Harbor Hotel, where new blocks of scaffolding and construction forced me onto streets I didn't recognize. A major snowstorm had been predicted for that evening. What am I doing? I whispered several times under my breath as I turned down incorrect one-way streets. It felt wrong that it was late, that I was going out of my way to see him and that if I hurried home, I might kiss my family goodnight before they went to sleep. I had long since worked my way back to wholeness and sanity since recovering from this painful love affair. I had landed intact and thankfully in a rich and fulfilled life with the man I adored. There were evenings when I stood in my kitchen with flour caked hands, trying to perfect my tarte tatin, a fire burning in the living room, the scent of fall leaves outside. <clears throat> My kids would be playing a piece together in the adjacent music room and asking me to join them. Mom, come play hide and tree with us, they'd say, and my heart would soar. So why was I here? When you fall in love at 20, I wondered, as I drove around lost in the narrow streets of Boston's North End, does the heart form around the other person like an old tree slowly absorbs a sign hung on it when it was a sapling? And then when it's gone, do you ever feel the lack of it, feel its imprint? where it once rested. Thank you so much, Julie. Wow, thank you. Such a, <laughs> such a, a wonderful tapestry of, of all of, of sort of the main, the high, the main moments. Um, there's so much, I feel like there's so much to talk about with both of your books and the territory, how they overlap is really fascinating to me. Um, can we start by just hearing from you about the process of what it was like writing these books? And for like, for Julie, I know for you, it was years and years. Um, Sarah, I'm curious about the time span of how this, when you kind of first conceived of wanting this to be a book and how long and just sort of what that process looked like. <laughs> um, I, so this, the events that I write about in XO, are about nine years old at this point. Um, and after they happened and kind of recovering from uh, my relationship ended, the affair ended and I was on my own for a while. Um, I was 
a, I am a fiction writer. And so I just figured I was going to write fiction and I would write about this as fiction. And I did a little bit, um, but I felt like I couldn't quite touch on the things I really wanted to touch on in the fiction. For some reason, there was something that was kind of keeping me out of it. Um, and then I, I, I met a guy, I got married, I had a couple kids, we moved a couple times, I was busy, I wasn't writing a ton. Um, and then the, the pandemic happened, my eldest cat died, that becomes the opening scene of the book. Um, and that really was the kind of trigger for writing this book. Something kind of clicked in my head and I was like, you know what, I just have to write this as nonfiction, even though I'm not a nonfiction writer. Um, and even if I just do it for myself, just to kind of get it down, as a manuscript and I can put it away just so that it's out of like my psyche, I gotta do it. So I did it, it happened fairly quickly. Um, I did work with an editor and I did do a bunch of revisions. I, I was really torn the whole time between like, am I doing this for me or am I doing this because I wanna publish it? Um, and then it, as, as you all know now, <laughs> it ended up getting published. So um, I was happy for that, but I think the, I think it, it it wasn't so much a conscious decision as it was this idea that like, I just have to get this out of me. It was like kind of blocking me from a lot of what I wanted to be doing. And I was like, I just have to do it. And so I did it and here, and here it is. <laughs> am I, am I, can you hear me? Um, I wish I, I have to just figure out how to say this quickly because there's so much for me to say about my 40 year process of seeing this book in print. It is, it is so huge for me because um, I wrote the first part of this book at age 22, right after the heartbreak, because I had all the details. I did not keep a journal during my romance in Paris, but when I was heartbroken at age 22, I, it all spilled out of me word for word, every conversation that we had had as if it was imprinted indelibly on my memory. But then I put it all away. So for three months, I sat on a bench in Boston, tears smudging the brown ink, with my fancy pen and I had three notebooks. I put them away for about 10 years. Then I took them out and every couple of years I'd work on it, add new material and then put it away again. And then find, and it had a different title. It, and then I tried sending it out way before it was good enough because back then I had not yet read a really important book about memoir, which is that memoir is about one thing. Mm -hmm. I had this thought, I'm finally writing, I'm writing the story and I added everything but the kitchen sink. All my boyfriends each got a whole chapter, you know, all my twenties. Finally, I learned that I had to cut it all. I cut a hundred pages and I restructured it. And then I, I found one day the title, I mean, I'm, I'm condensing it so much, but really what happened is that I turned it into a novel because one person I sent it to said, I love the story, but I think I can sell it if you make it fiction. So I turned the whole memoir into fiction and then she didn't like it anymore. And then I got discouraged for another 10 years. So I put it away again. And then believe it or not, I got excited again and I turned it back to memoir. And I think I brought it to Grub Street for a class called Your First Five Pages. And when I got to that class, there was red through my first five pages. And I was so upset because I thought that I had gotten it to a point that I was happy with and I was discouraged again for another probably 10 years I am that old that many years have gone by finally I contacted Joy and um, I said this is something I have to do whether it kills me if it's the last thing I do before my last days on earth and I I had read this book on memoir I restructured she helped me restructure and then a new title came to me the whole thing started to fall into place and then I knew I had a book um, that's in a nutshell. Wow. So that's quite, quite a, 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 a whole lifelong journey yeah. with the story. You know, one thing that really struck me reading these books back to back was it wasn't just that there were commonalities rooted in the focus on the romantic relationship, but you can see overlap thematically. And I think it'd be really interesting to hear, um, both of you speak about how centering your book on romance, how does that, how did that allow you to explore other themes? You know, like, did you plan ahead that you would write about these other thematic things in addition, or did it just sort of arise naturally as the story unfolded? Or I'm curious about that. Julie, you seem like you have a 
Yeah. Also, I just noticed that this Christine LaBelle asked what the book was called um, that helped, that changed my life, really. It's Marion Roach's book called The Memoir Project, which really helped me because she said memoir is a universal truth as illustrated by a personal story. My universal truth was that if you're young and this is your first love and it's deeply romantic and highly intense and ends suddenly with, well, without any answers by uh, at the hands of somebody who does not communicate well, that can embed itself in your heart and soul for an entire lifetime. That was my universal truth. And I think my story illustrates that. So that, that helped me and that's how I got to where I knew that, oh, this doesn't belong in this book. It doesn't have enough to do with the main story. Anything that seemed to help the main story, I kept everything else I got rid of. Was that a bit like yours, Sarah? Sort of yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I, um, <laughs> I feel like I did not, I, I write about romance a lot. I write about relationships a lot. I think that's really interesting. Um, but I really, and I knew I, I, as I was writing about this and I knew I wanted to be writing about this, I was also like, I want this to be about other things too. And so, I mean, I think my, my book definitely is a memoir, but it kind of falls outside of that genre a little bit too in, in its essayisticness in that I, I'm kind of not really writing about, I, there is a through line. I am writing about one thing, one story arc in my life, but there's all these other elements that I was kind of weaving into to the main storyline. Um, and as I was writing, I think that's kind of how I made peace with this idea that I was writing about these romantic pieces of my life. Well, I was like, but I'm also writing about a lot of other things. I'm writing about God and philosophy and spiders and, and you know, anything I could weave in that felt like it was like, could become part of the story, could become part of the fabric of this world that I was creating. I got it in there. <laughs> It's so fascinating, Sarah, to, to see that. And I, I was really struck by that in your book, the way you do have these, these kind of forays into these other philosophical questions and, and topics. And in some ways, like the memoir form is like, it, it's this time in your life, right? But you're also create, you're also curating something that is by, by what you're kind of putting together by what you're choosing to juxtapose, you're kind of curating something that um, isn't exactly the way it happened really. <laughs> so it, it's just a very interesting uh, approach, I think, and, and a very interesting to think of the, the memoir genre as being having that like slight fictional quality maybe. Yeah. Um, well, you're always choosing what you bring into it, right? Even though it's memoir, even though you're writing what happened and you're trying to be as honest as you can and as, as honest as your memory will allow, you're still curating the story. You're still choosing what to put in and what to leave out. So. There's always that aspect yeah. of the process. Um, something I'm, I'm really curious about is what is the, what would you guys say that is, was the, the biggest struggle for you in, in this, in kind of putting in your book together? Was it um, something craft related in the writing, pro in the writing itself? Was it some of the choices about what to include, what to show? Um, was it dealing with the, the topic itself? What was, what, what would you say you struggled with? I think for me, um, one of the reasons I wanted to make it into a novel was to protect not just myself, but my family and notably my poor husband. <laughs> and um, everybody always says in a hushed voice as if he didn't know about the story or as if, as if somehow there's something I have to walk on eggshells around. How did you, and, and it's so funny because well, how did you, how did you tell your husband as if he didn't know this story from the day I met him? You know, it's so much a part of my past. Um, but for me, that was part partially what was so difficult because here I am, and a lot of people, are, you know, as you know, when you're trying to promote a book, you try to get everybody and his uncle to, to write a review. And there were so many reviews by, by these young readers who just so totally missed the point. And they would write things like, I didn't understand why Julie went back when she, well, I, I thought she said she moved on. Why did she feel she had to contact him again? I mean, that's just people who don't understand the grace of human emotion and 
happen is just so simplistic not to understand that yes i i that's the whole point of my book that first love embeds itself deeply and it's hard to move on or it's not that it's hard to move on one of the things i hope readers to take away from my book anyway is that our memories are not to be canceled or deleted but cherished and they are they make up who we are and the part of the reason i brought up the wordsworth poem is that the poem plays a big part in the book it's something i'm teaching him while we're having this very charming beautiful little teacher student thing with poetry but it comes back at the end because one of his lines is in our life there is or with these memories there is life and food for future years and that's exactly how I feel that our memories are to be cherished no matter what the outcome and um what I have left of myself at age 20 living on Rue Bonaparte in Paris will always be there for me and I don't want to forget those things you know a lot of people throw their stuff away I was struck by that for you Sarah when you got rid of old memorabilia I still have the stack of letters from that era because they're there I, I can't explain it it's it's not just and that part was hard I'm sorry I went so circuitously but one of the things that was hard for me was admitting to that I still have those emotions about the past that's hard, you know, especially when, you, you know, my husband did not read this version. He read it 20 years ago and it wasn't that good. And I don't blame him. I don't want him to read it because I don't want him to be reminded that this was something that was so important to me that I had to spend 40 years telling the story. Hmm. <laughs> I, I similar to what Julie is saying, I think the hardest part of writing this book was also the best part of writing this book, which is that I got to kind of turn around and look at this moment in my life with such like a magnifying glass and kind of examine it. And that's kind of amazing, but it's also really hard too, because how do you look at the past while also being in the future? How do you exist in a memory while also just living your normal life? You know, like, I was writing this during the beginning of the pandemic. We were still in lockdown. My kids were in diapers. I was like, <laughs> you know, life was not easy. Um, and so this was like a reprieve from that. But also it's hard. It's hard to turn away from, from a life that you've created for yourself and a life that you're happy with to look at something that was once happy and then was hard, was also heartbreaking. Um, so it was, it's this real balance between like the joy of being able to do that and the, and the, like the real difficulty of being able to get back into that and kind of inhabiting, you know, when you're writing a scene about heartbreak, it's hard not to just bring that into the rest of your life. Cause you're really feeling it. Um, there, there was a beautiful quote by the writer, um, Leah Hager Cohen. Do you know that writer? She just said, because there is some kind of, um, reconciliation to be living in the past just like you said Sarah and then and then loving your current life and she said a Paris Blue could speak to anyone who's ever yearned for closure that never came but her memoir doesn't simply try to make sense of a, of a bewildering romance through telling the story she manages to bless the past in all its complexity while giving herself fully to the present and I thought that really put the finger on it exactly what you were saying, you know, hmm. that we don't have to um, think, oh no, that, that part of my life, I've thrown all those photos and all those letters away. Um, anyway, it's it's such an interesting topic for me that um, I'm happy that anyone wants to listen to me talk about it. Well, you know what's interesting this is like there are these, like given the elements of heartbreak and the fickleness of memory, um, I'm wondering if, I mean, you might not even be able to put your finger on things that you had to do this with, but were there tangible moments in the text where you had to make a decision to fictionalize something slightly for the sake of the story? Or did you find that um, writing about something that happens to very, you know, various years ago, like, did that space um, 
make, you know, like blur the lines of like, what is the truth, right? Maybe there were even moments in the writing where you were telling the best truth that you could reach for, but I'd be interested to hear about what that felt like as you were writing and how you made those decisions. Good question. Yeah, I, I definitely didn't fictionalize anything, but there were parts of the story, especially in, in the first part of the book where I'm covering a huge span of time in, in the relationship that I had been in before I got into the affair. I was kind of compressing. So it wasn't necessarily fictionalizing, but I had to like squish, you know, I had to like yeah. kind of pick out and kind of combine moments into, they were still true. They're still the things that happened. They're still, and especially the things I felt and the things I remembered feeling. Um, but I think all in all, it was, it was easy to find the right moments to make the narrative work mm -hmm. without having to fictionalize anything. I mean, I made up the names, I fictionalized the names, but other than that, the, the biggest fictionalization was I had to, I had to pull things out that would make these people recognizable, um, uh, for people reading it. And, and, and that's more of a, it's not really a lie. It's an omission, right? It's like, I'm going to leave this out for everybody's better good. Um, but other than that, I think it was kind of fun to find the right moments to make the narrative, to make the narrative work the way it needs to work for a story. My answer is very similar to Sarah's in that I am embarrassed to admit how many times I met Luke in Boston way past the relationship 20 years later. I mean, it wasn't three in the book. I just chose, I consolidated, just like Sarah said, I consolidated all these trips. Joy helped me with this. I didn't know how to do it. Which ones do I keep? So um, I put them, I consolidated them into three times in which I saw him post, post the young relationship, but there might have been a dozen and that is embarrassing. So I'm glad that that was, I think, and it's not really fictionalizing either. It's just, like you said, I omitted the other 10 or something like that. Yeah, J Julie, I, I absolutely loved working with you. I just want to say that, that you were like a, a dream writer to work with. But um, I would say, yeah, that's very, speaking of craft and the craft of writing memoir, like that, that was such an interesting moment or in, at the end of your, your book to, to work with you on, because I felt like, well, the, the sort of truth of what your story was, was more that you really encountered Luke in this one time, I feel like, and, and yet it sort of gets more, it, the, the, the actual truth was that you did have these different encounters with him. Um, and yet I feel like emotionally, we feel it more the, the way you have it currently in the text. So it's like this very interesting decision that I think memoir writers can make, which is what, it's not yeah is it is it fictionalizing or is it really just kind of um arranging the the, the sort of happenings of your life in a way that really kind of brings out the thing well, how it really yeah, felt exactly right mm -hmm. it it has to work as a story i mean you would not no reader would want to read <laughs> about each of these very boring encounters that i had looking for answers always looking for answers never getting them and then, uh, yeah, that, that saved face just a little bit by consolidating. <laughs> and then I think we have a question. Uh, does I get? The, we sort of talked about this a little bit. I'll, I'll ask it. Keith asks. Um, I just lost. It. So Keith asks in the chat. Um, curious about as to how you both created boundaries to keep the past from bleeding through and obscuring the present, especially while you were in the thick of the past emotion. So Sarah, I know you, you kind of mentioned that it was hard to do this, but were there things that you did around writing these, about, around being in the text to kind of keep them separate? Mm. Um, I don't remember having any kind of rituals or routines. I'm sure I must have because I almost always do. I think one thing that I did and maybe I should have just gone to see a therapist, <laughs> but I really talked with my husband a lot while I was writing this book. And maybe that was hard for him to hear a lot of the stuff that I was dredging up, but luckily he's very patient and he's a great listener. And he knew about the story since we, the, actually the day we met. Um, so I, I think that was kind of how I did it. I was able to be working and then at night we would like debrief, how was your day, how was work? And I would tell him if I was like kind of still feeling it or 
like had something that I had kind of touched on that I needed to like talk through and having that space that like kind of sounding board, I think really kind of counterintuitively helped me keep the story as the story versus letting it kind of touch everything. It's like kind of that thing where if you look at something directly, it stays there. It doesn't start to, to bleed everywhere else. So I found that super helpful. I know not everyone has a partner like that, but if you have a friend or a therapist or a writing coach who, who can kind of like hold that space for you, I think that's invaluable when you're dredging this stuff up. Yeah. Yeah. Mine was a very different experience because as I said, I don't even, it's, it's the strangest thing for me, but this is just such ancient history. Most of it was written more than 30, 40 years ago. I mean, I made it better, but the story itself, and then I added more current material, the, you know, after the 20 mature person, um, wisdom and understanding of the role that memory plays in our lives and that kind of thing. So for me, it wasn't really dredging it up because um, it was, it was written so long ago. I can't even believe it's, it's that people like it. <laughs> That's how I feel about it because I, I don't even, I mean, sometimes when I was reading some of the early stuff, um, I've been working on it for so long that it's, it's almost like I could say the whole thing from, from memory now. But anyway, I don't know where I'm going with this, I, but it for me, it's not, it wasn't dredging anything up because I've been married, today's my anniversary. I've been married 34 years. So, you know, that's this story. That's when, when people say, how does your husband feel about it? it? Those people don't understand that you can, I mean, obviously my husband is the real love of my life, but this is such an interesting story because this was my first love and it never really, I never really got over it. I can say that without being embarrassed or, you know, like, whispering it because it's just one of those things and what I learned after this was published and I started to hear from readers regularly is that so many people have a story like this so many people said it brought back their own stories grown men said they couldn't stop sobbing at the end because it just struck some very very familiar chord with them and so that's what that's all I wanted and I couldn't have hoped for or a better reaction from people. So um, I'm off topic here. I'm but. so happy. Yeah, I will. I'm, I'm, I know there is, well, there is something very universal in, I mean, in, in like that first love in relationships and heartbreak. I mean, I think all of these things are things that we all identify with on a very deep level and they bring up all kinds of stuff for us. Um, I just want to, in our final 10 minutes or so, um, I know there's a lot of, there are a few questions in the chat and I also want to make sure we we turn a little bit to memoir and the and the the craft of writing memoir, which we are already, but a little more directly too. Um, someone, let's see, Rachel asks, what advice do you both have in practice within the text to obscure the names and lives of people in your past for the people in the present who might find it damaging? So that's um, Julie. I know you change names in yours, right? And Sarah, you don't mention names do you what we what thoughts do you have on that if there are people that you want to kind of I mean clearly people can will be able to recognize themselves in both of your books but what yeah any thoughts on that let's start with Sarah and then go to Julie okay um when I wrote the first draft I I didn't obscure anything and I think that that was really freeing I think that that's really the way to go before you get to the point where other people that might matter are going to see it and especially before you get to the point of publishing it you know i think i went through i don't know 21 different drafts where i was calling this information i changed names the few names that do appear i changed names other people are just the role in my life um and then Again, it was it was this process. I, I know some writers of memoir actually just change little things, and you see that kind of statement in the in the front of a of a memoir that um, identifying facts might have been changed. Um, I just pulled things out, and I think I could get away with that because it's a short book, and I'm really kind of tangential, so I could get away with pulling out some of that stuff. Um, Julie's book is a little more involved, so she might have dealt with this differently, but I really um, 
I did as I did the best I could on my own. And then I worked with an editor, the editor and publisher of autofocus, we worked together. And I had kind of a, a, a great setup in that regard in that we actually had gone through the same MFA program. And he knew all these characters, he was actually kind of, he's kind of in the background of some of these scenes, which is interesting. So I had the great uh, privilege of him being like, take this out. This is too recognizable. Take this out. Even if I didn't know who you're talking about, I might know who you're talking about. So that was was invaluable. And I think if you're if you are writing memoir and you're getting to the point where you're publishing it, work with either an editor or a coach or someone who can kind of help and guide you with those things. Like, what is too telling of a detail? And that I think it's again, it's always good to have kind of some someone to sound off of and kind of help you see. It's very, very, very hard to be objective about your own life. That's one of the beauties of writing memoir, right? Is like you can actually do just in there tell the truth. Um, but then it's very hard to see like what might what others might be seeing when they read. And that's why bringing in a, another pair of eyes is super helpful. Mm -hmm. I don't have a very good answer for any of that because I didn't. The only person I really said damaging things about was the flute teacher who seduced me in the back of the garden <laughs> and and this guy, Luke, and both of those names were changed. However, Luke does know about the book and I was worried for a while that he might sue me, but um, I don't think he, he will. <laughs> I don't think he will. I mean, I know he won't, but I don't think he'll ever read the book either. So um, I wasn't really worried about that because I could only say wonderful things about my husband. Th that's the funny part is, I mean, I don't, there was nothing I was worried about in terms of damaging. I don't know what I do because I don't even, you know, I don't, I think this is my one and only. A lot of people ask me, do you have another book in you? And I'm like, hmm, I really thought about that. So, you know, and when people say, I love your writing, I'm, like I said before, I'm always so surprised because I just, I find it's just so simply written from the heart, but not like when I read Sarah's writing, Joy's writing, these sentences are so complex and brilliant and, and, and just so descriptive. And I feel as if I, there's not one word in my book that you have to look up because I don't use big words. Anyway, I'm only saying that because um, I'm going off again. Um, we were talking about damaging is that where I was? Did I just lose my whole train of thought? Damaging things. I, I didn't really write about anybody that I was worried um, about being upset, except for those two people, and I couldn't care less about them. If the flute teacher had were not alive still, I would have used his real name, but <laughs> didn't want to get slapped with slander or something. Yeah, like it's always such an it's always such an interesting question about like how much to yeah, how, and I think there's a question about this, how much to, to, to fictionalize or how much to include. And I mean, I, I know it's a, just, just such a question that memoir writers are always uh, sort of toggling with um, what, to, what to change and who will it affect. And I mean, I imagine it, it is much more uh, of a thing to really wonder if you should do if it's people that, are very, that, that you're, you're writing directly about, like your very close family. Um, someone ha does have a question. I think it's uh, mostly, I think maybe it relates to you, Julie, and to your process of, uh, well, maybe to Sarah too, because I know, because Sarah, you write in fiction also, but someone said um, they're curious about the process of turning one's own facts into fiction and back again for the sake of genre. Well, um, I meant to add one quick thing, which is that when this one agent said, I think you should turn it into a novel, and then she didn't like it anymore. Um, I thought, oh, but I, I want to keep it a novel because then I can say anything I want and nobody will know it's my husband or I won't feel embarrassed about still not being over this first love. But what I realized finally, and this is what finally made me realize I had a book, is that other people read it and said, Julie, I think this has to be a memoir because it's the only honest version of the story. You can't just pretend that you're turning the story into a novel. It wasn't really a novel, it's just thinly disguised. And so for me, it had to be a memoir. And I know that everybody says that fiction writing is always autobiographical anyway, but for me, um, I wouldn't even have the first inkling how to write fiction, truthfully. So 
Yeah, I mean, honestly, if I had been able to write this book as fiction, I, I would have done it that way. But it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't do it. It just refused to do it. The story was just like, nah, -uh, not going to be fiction. It's got to be nonfiction. And if you want this done, you're going to do it my way. And I was like, eh, all right, story knows best. <laughs> Which I think is true in fiction, as true in fiction as it is in nonfiction. The story always knows best. Trust the story. So, yeah, yeah. It's so interesting how like a voice will just emerge, and it's like the story wants to be told in this particular voice. I have a story right now, like it's emerged in some kind of fable, fairy tale, uh, oral storytelling voice. It's like okay, I never write that way, but the story wants to be told in this way. Um, but so, yeah, it's interesting how. Same with, with the genre, right? Like you just have to think about it as memoir maybe or or truthful in order to get it out. Like something about the conception of it in your head is that uh, is instrumental to it being written. Yeah, it's funny. I say a lot when I teach fiction classes that like to me, um, the only way I know to tell the truth is by writing fiction. Um, so I think this conversation is kind of taking us to interesting places and thinking about like, well, what is truth? What kind of truth are we trying to get at when in the storytelling world? Um, but on that note, I would love to hear if you all just had any advice for aspiring memoirists, fo folks that are writing in the midst of writing their first memoirs, you know, like, would you, do you have any recommendations or, um, after having just gone through it, is there something that you would advise people to do or not to do? <laughs> In a second, can you just think of something amazing? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, Kate. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think I would just say again, trust the story, follow the story. Um, and do, especially if you're writing nonfiction, write what feels true to you in the first and early drafts and then it will develop as time goes on don't worry in the beginning about getting it right just do it and um and then kind of follow it trust it you're going to revise it you're going to make it different you're going to make it better it might take you know this book kind of came out of me very quickly and i, I think of those those projects as like a miracle project. But then you have a situation like with Julie where it takes a really long time. And so you have to trust whatever your process is, that's the right process for you. And I think I was, I, sometimes I look at this and I'm like, I'm actually, I'm like, how did I do this that fast? Like, I, I feel, should I be embarrassed that I wrote this book that fast? And then I'm like, no, I mean, the next book will probably take me a decade, you know, like it's just, I'll pay the price somewhere. But it so what I, no matter what your process is, just kind of try to trust it. Always try to trust it. Most of writing is not knowing, right? It's just this unknowing. You're pushing yourself into this unknowing and you're seeing what's going to happen. So as much as you can, trust your process and eventually it will get you where you where you want to be. So I think that's the best advice I have. That's good. That's good. That's good advice. I probably don't have anything to add to that except don't give up. That's that's my advice because I people 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 my friends have been hearing about this book for 30 years now and you know they started to roll their eyes and they said, Julie, why do you have to do this? And you know, in the past year of having interviews, I always start with um this Maya Angelou quote because it's exactly the right answer. And she's said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. And that is how I felt. I, you know, I went through breast cancer, like your intro said, and when I didn't know what my future held, I said to my friends, can you please just make sure somebody publishes my story? I just want my story to be out there. So. Yeah, that, that is, I think that such good advice on both fronts. And I think those are not giving up and sort of listening to what needs to come up. I think if, if you were, yeah, if you're gonna do anything as a writer, um, I think that's it, that's it to do, right? Listen to, to kind of what wants to come up through you and do it regularly. It's a lifelong practice. Uh, things, if you show up for it, stuff will start, stuff will come up to the surface. And what you really want to write, what, what is trying to come out of you as, as these writers uh, have shown us will come up and will, will make its, itself known. Um, thank you. Thank you both so much. And uh, huge thanks to everyone. Thank okay. you for having us. Thank you. Thank nice you. to meet everyone.
So in our in our very final minute here, um, I'll just make a quick announcement that uh, very excitingly, the our, our year long, well, actually, you have to start calling it that, our 10 month long manuscript program is opening for applications tomorrow. And we do have several sections. Kate, who's here with the, yeah, obviously part of the discussion tonight, um, Kate leads the novel sections. There's a revision novel section for people who have completed a full length novel manuscript. There's also a first draft novel section and Dorian Fox leads the memoir section. Um, Carolyn Zykowski also, there's a, there's a nonfiction uh, section she leads that is not that is non-memoir, non-fiction, non-memoir, and she also leads a poetry hybrid section. So we have a lot of different sections of that program. Applications open tomorrow. If you're interested in working on a book length project over the course of 10 months, March through December, and want to do so in a, a supportive group that meets monthly, you might be interested in our program. I just put a link in the chat. You can also find it on our website. And also, if there's any memoir writers here who are looking for support and looking to study with a group, meet other writers, we have a few spots left in some of our fall memoir workshops up on our website. I'll drop a link here in the chat. But one in particular is on um, personal or braided essays, which might be an interesting topic to explore for someone who might maybe doesn't want to tackle a book length project, but maybe you're interested in exploring and weaving together some aspect of your life. And um, actually, and Sarah's book is a really wonderful example of weaving things, weaving different topics. But um, we have a couple spots left in a braided essays workshop. We also have a workshop writing toward wildness, um, nonlinear memoir. So just, just some ideas of stuff that is up on our current roster of uh, our current lineup of workshops. But we hope to see you at, um, we have some other events also feel free to RSVP to our other free community events. If you want to join us on the first Fridays of the month for community writing, we're also here, we do that. And we hope to, we hope to see you uh, virtually or in person at some point, if and when we, we are back. But thank you all for coming. And there's lots of, lots of nice things being said in the chat. So Sarah, Julie, definitely check out all the stuff being said before we sign off here. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everyone. Jim. Nice Thank to meet you, everyone.